Hi, in this video I'm going to be talking to you about typical MOOC learning objects and we'll cover the types of learning objects that are generally used in MOOCs, what their purpose is in the MOOC, how it relates to low-cost production and this is relating to both the money you might have to spend to do it or the time it might take you to do this as well. Now during this video I'd appreciate it if you could take some notes because what we want to do is we want you to think about as we present each learning object type whether this might be suitable for the type of MOOC that you might build. Okay first of all we'll look at learning materials often referred to as learning content. Passive documents really just consisting of text and images maybe in Word or PDF format. Um, now these would be considered not to be very engaging um, in actual fact as well they can be quite time consuming to produce even more time consuming than producing videos sometimes but there's lots of free stuff out there so it might be worth considering searching the web to see what you could find rather than starting creating these documents from scratch. Now this is really an aside it's to do with course text. These are the instructions about the course, the purpose of materials in your course activities, the sort of things that you would communicate to a student as they went along in the course, maybe the requirements of the course, what they need to do to get a certificate. Try to keep these types of instructions out of your learning materials. Really, they're not suitable for putting in there if you want to reuse those learning materials in a different context or at a different time. Videos. Now in a way we'll be doing a lot about videos in this course because they are very popular. There's a certain debate about whether they're effective or not but generally people are very happy with videos in MOOCs. So they can be very engaging. That may depend on the skills of the presenter. So it may be worth gaining those skills or improving those skills. Uh, one type of video is screen capture where you basically have a video of what's going on on your computer screen or your device screen. So you could record slides from a PowerPoint presentation that I'm doing now. You might be doing a demonstration of some software on your computer that can be captured. You might have a whiteboard at which you're drawing or writing on the screen or writing on slides and of course it would capture the audio as well and maybe a headshot in fact there's a lot of debate about the value of headshots. You could also do regular videos maybe taken on a fairly cheap camera or on a mobile phone it could be of experiments in a lab might be worth investing in a little tripod of discussions between people, uh, interviews with someone, case studies or maybe procedures. These are relatively cheap and easy to create once you have a few tricks and know how to do it. One thing you should consider for low cost is you may need to manage expectations, both your expectations of what the production quality should be and possibly the learner's expectations of what it should be. Webinars are live online presentations where you present to a camera just on, on your computer, just like I'm doing now, but it's been broadcast live out to a large number of people on the web. Now they're very inexpensive to do now and it, they do allow some interactivity unlike what I'm doing now which is a pure recording and can't have interactivity during the recording. Webinars do allow interactivity with the live audience through a chat area and of course you can record them as well because not everyone can make it to your live presentation which begs the question can we use these recordings of webinars as uh, learning content in themselves. Could we use a webinar for video production? Well generally they're a little long for what's considered to be optimal length but there's no doubt about it that people present much better to a live audience than they do just to their computer. One of the things about it is for a webinar you should prepare well but you have a greater toleration for mistakes uh, and there's very little temptation to edit it afterwards. So it does really reduce your workload. So it's inexpensive, reduced workload, so quite a suitable format. 
Probably the only disadvantage is maybe the length of the recordings. Simulations. This is where we replicate reality on a computing device, whether it be a PC or a mobile phone. It allows to people to explore systems. Now, these can be varied levels of realism. A simulation can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet that allows people to change numbers on the spreadsheet and see what happens. They're exploring, or it could be some very complex 3D system where you might put on a headset. They are very expensive to develop. As you move anyway towards sophistication at all, they're very time consuming to develop and you need specialized skills. But there may be some free simulators available out there. So they're worth considering if you can uh, find free ones. Which brings us on to the topic of free web resources because there is lots of free stuff out there. YouTube videos, articles from online magazines or even print-based magazines that have an online version, more formal research papers, guides and instructions on how to do things. And lastly, I'll just mention eBooks here, complete online texts on a topic. In fact, it might be worth considering finding a free eBook and building your course around it, making it the recommended textbook for your course. You could consider writing an ebook to go along with your MOOC, but in actual fact, writing an ebook is probably a much bigger challenge than the low cost approach to uh, producing MOOCs that we're recommending. And as I say, you can find free simulations on the web. Perhaps there'd be other free soft for doing certain tasks that you can get on the web. I should say a little bit on intellectual property. Open educational resources is the term used for learning materials that are published free on the web for anyone to use and they use usually use creative commons license but it must be said that many people feel that if a resource is available for public viewing on the web then they don't mind you pointing your learners towards it so you may have you may consider it acceptable in your course to link to resources that are publicly viewable on the web but don't in any way claim that they're your materials. Interactive multimedia. In a way, interactive multimedia is like video, but it has a certain learner interaction built in. Now, this can vary in sophistication from uh, just simple quiz questions in the middle of a presentation. In fact, you would barely call that interactive multimedia, but it could be um, it could be more sophisticated where the learning path varies as well. Now, nowadays, these are generally developed with rapid development tools, software that may, may insert into a presentation system like PowerPoint. Um, uh, but even though these are rapid development tools, it still takes a lot of time to develop the materials and they can be a little dull a lot of learners complain that it's just a lot of clicking and interacting with with the computer that's not very interesting um they were probably better than a straight video like this but because it takes so much effort to develop them you wonder are you really getting value for their your effort and in terms of a low cost or a low effort production of MOOCs they may be considered not to have the payback you need. We could say that discussions for those of you that want to teach topics where there's a certain amount of maybe a debate involved or there's no right answer or it depends on the context or you want people to get a deeper understanding these CMOOC style or connectivist MOOCs or dis discursive type courses, uh, we should embed discussions. Discussions are probably useful for any course anyway. Now there are two types of discussions that you can put in a course synchronous where everybody is on live at the same time or asynchronous where people contribute to discussions. Some people can come back later and see. So let's have a look at these two types of discussions. Live discussions, now, these can be PC-based video conferencing like Skype groups that get together or Google Hangouts that can be done for free. But you can also have them over a chat system where it's just text systems and people are chatting live and typing their comments. Now, there's obviously issues around how big a group can you deal with in a live discussion. 
And how can you organize those groups? That's quite a challenge. Asynchronous discussions are not live. They're usually done on discussion boards or discussion fora. There is no issue with the availability of people because people can come on whenever they want and respond to what is ever up there on the discussion board. A lot of people consider these to be educationally more effective because it gives people the time to consider their responses to questions or to other people's uh, comments on the discussion board. They're certainly low cost to set up, although you may say that there is some costs or effort involved in monitoring the discussions. You can host them internally on most platforms, but you may choose to host them externally on Facebook or some other system. Now, the question with forums is, how can you get the learners actively involved in the forums? And that is quite a challenge. Assessment, let's have a look at some assessment objects you might have. Autograded objective tests. Now, these are generally known as multiple choice quizzes, but you can have other types of answers other than multiple choice. And they're more properly called objective tests insofar as the co computer does the grading, so there is no human subjectivity in the grading of the test. They're certainly scalable because the computer is going to grade them for you. Um, they're relatively easy to set up trivial questions can be quickly done and it's obviously cheap um, but to think of sophisticated questions that really drill down down into their understanding it's really quite a challenge there are questions over reliability and validity of these are they testing the real learning outcomes of your course can they reliably do that and are they testing the right things but one of the things that should be considered is quizzes for motivation. So to some extent, if you use them on a fairly shallow basis where they just test some recall, it's a way of checking out how people really watched the videos or read the materials that you've supplied. Essays. Well, obviously, essays are a more sophisticated assessment technique and very suitable for really assessing a deeper understanding and particularly where there is no right answer some debate or some applicability in different contexts they're relatively cheap to set up but how are you going to assess these at scale are they really suitable for MOOCs at all people have been talking about robo or robot grading or automated grading of essays but that's not available yet and uh, certainly not available in a low cost context. However, peer assessment may be coming to the rescue. Peer assessment is where students assess or learners assess each other's work. And you can use this for essays and other types of written or objects even that are created. If somebody does a video, they can submit it and it can be assessed by their peers. It's certainly low cost to set up and low cost to operate because the learners themselves are going to assess and grade each other. But is it reliable? Is it accurate? Well, research has shown that it is quite accurate. And of course, if you're really worried about it, if you're working on large scale, chances are somebody will get several very poor uh, evaluations or poorly done evaluations and you might consider having an appeal system for the few of those that turn up. But it should be remembered that peer assessment is an extra learning opportunity because people get to see other work. So to finish off now, I suppose I should give you an activity and what I wanted, to, as I said at the start, I would have liked if you'd taken some notes and considered the different learning objects and considered whether you would use that learning object in your MOOC. And feel free to discuss this in the discussion forum. Bye for now.